euphorbia. They've kind of got a reputation as an alternative to cactus. But that really does a disservice to these fantastic plants. Today, I want to not only introduce you to these fantastic plants, but I really want to celebrate the interesting and wonderful world of euphorbia. Now, what then is a euphorbia and why is it different to a cactus? Well, euphorbias come from all over the world, from the absolutely harsh, arid landscapes of the Andes in South America, across through monsoonal India and tropical North Australia, down into the deserts of South Africa. Euphorbias are found almost everywhere on the planet. And that variety of habitats has shaped their form. The evolutionary pressures required to respond to plants growing in the harsh, arid landscape of the mountains, for example, very different to those in a rainforest or a jungle. And so the fascinating thing is, although many of the euphorbias that we know and love do indeed look just like cacti, there is a vast and varied array of forms. And that's what makes these plants not only so joyful to look at, but also fantastic to collect. So I'm gonna really talk about two main things today. What is a euphorbia? And how do we care for them in our collections? And to do that, I've got a few different species that are gonna guide me on this fantastic journey into what is a wonderful genus of plants. Now, how do we know what a euphorbia is? They come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Everything from the euphorbia polygona, which has that more classical cacti shape, fascinating and very interesting thick white waxy farina to protect it from the sun. We've got Euphorbia obesa, sometimes commonly known as the baseball plant for its round form. Through to these more leafy plants, Euphorbia bupleurifolia, or one of my favorites, Euphorbia eclonii, which grows almost entirely underground except for the leaves that emerge from the top. This is a succulent, the leaves aren't succulent, Underground, there is a thick succulent tuber, which when it's big enough, I can raise this above the soil, grow it as a cordiciform plant. Now, all of those plants look completely different, as do many in the uh, genus. But there are two very simple tells to enable us to identify a euphorbia. And the first of those is the sap. So what I'm gonna do I'm going to take this Euphorbia obesa here. You can see rats had a bit of a chew on it before, so it's already not looking its best. Give it a bit of a nick and we'll see if we can get a bit of sap to come out. And look at that. Now, that thick white milky sap, it's called latex. And the purpose of latex is to prevent infections, pathogens, disease getting into this plant when it's damaged. It's toxic. Different species of euphorbia have different degrees of toxicity. But when it dries, it'll dry almost like this clear rubbery substance that plugs up the wound. This plant's gonna be absolutely fine. Now, all of those plants in the euphorbia genus have that same sap. Doesn't matter whether it's the grandest tree or the tiniest little annual popping up in our lawns. Cut them open, they all bleed white. The second distinctive feature of the Euphorbia genus are its flowers. Now I don't want to get too technical with you today, but I can show you, for example, this here is Euphorbia Jansen Vilensis. Now you might have seen this plant in another of my videos. And you can see at the end, these quite small, fairly uh, indistinctive flowers. 
All new forbias have flowers with a similar structure to this. You can see the same again in this Euphorbia eclonii. Now, sometimes they're a little bit more colourful. Their sizes are a little bit different sometimes. But they all have a similar structure. You're not going to find the grand, big, showy flowers of a cactus growing from the tip of the Euphorbia. Now, you might notice, if you look very closely, there is one noticeable difference about the flowers of these two plants. And that is their sex. The plants I'm sharing with you today, they're all relatively closely related. They all come from Southern Africa. And all these plants are what we call dioecious. Fantastic word. What it means is the plants are either male or female. And that means that this guy here with pollen on his flowers is a male plant. This Euphorbia eclonii however, has no pollen, it's a female. It means breeding these plants can be a little bit tricky. You need to ensure that you've got both a male and a female of the species that you want to grow. And if you can do that, there's another really interesting aspect about Euphorbia flowers. When they're pollinated, they form a seed capsule. And that seed capsule almost always contains three seeds and three seeds only. When it ripens, doesn't just drop the seeds to the floor and let them germinate, it explodes with force. So loud you can actually hear it. Shoots the seeds, in some instances meters away from the parent plant. Certainly makes collecting and harvesting euphorbia seeds something of an experience. And I'm gonna share with you a video later this week on a few methods for doing just that. So, interesting flower structures and explosive seed pods the second factor that helps us determine if a plant's a euphorbia or not. Now, going off on an aside, I said that these plants that I'm sharing with you today are all closely related. And it's fascinating because you've got a plant like this Euphorbia bupleurifolia and this Euphorbia Susanne. They don't look anything like each other. This one when in real active growth, ha growth has a real big crown of leaves emerging from the top. This is a low clump forming species. Over time, especially in habitat, can form a huge mound with all of these heads. Very different growth forms and yet surprisingly closely related. And that close relation means something very interesting. It can actually create strange and wonderful hybrids. Imagine that. I want you to stop and imagine. What do you think a hybrid between these two plants might look like? Would it have the leaves of this plant and the clumping habit of this one? Well, if you thought so, you're absolutely right. Because this is Euphorbia japonica. It's been created in cultivation and it is just that. A hybrid between those two plants and you can see the leaves of Bupleurifolia emerging from the top and that clumping form of Susanne. It's a beautiful plant, sometimes called uh, Euphorbia pineapple head or Euphorbia cockleburr if you're interested. Creating Euphorbia hybrids, it's a, a fascinating aspect of the cultivation of these plants if you like to play God. Now I'm not going to go too deep down that rabbit hole, I'll save that for another day. but it is something that's well worth considering if you're a collector of these plants and you do want to dabble with a bit of mad scientist stuff. So, that's what makes a euphorbia. In a moment, I'll tell you all about how to care for these plants. Euphorbia cultivation. Not a particularly difficult thing. Very similar to many other succulents that we might collect. These plants come from very varied habitats. So I'm going to focus on those today that come from the arid regions, in particular these succulent South African species that I've been sharing with you today. They all enjoy quite a gritty mineral soil. You can't see it here, I've got a topsoil on this one, but if you take a look at the soil on this guy, on this polygona, you can see 
very gritty, not a lot of an organic component to it. Well, very well draining. Keeps them happy, avoids rot. All the plants that I've shown you today are summer growers. The only exception to that is Euphorbia eclonii, which is a winter growing plant. Far more difficult to keep, also a far more obscure plant. Very unlikely to see this one available, so I'm not going to dig too deeply into that. But these other ones are summer growers, which means they need regular water through the warmer months. I water mine in Sydney twice a week with that mineral mix that I've got them in. Your conditions may vary though. With an occasional dilute fertilizer, just to promote a bit of growth. You can also use slow release fertilizer if you prefer. Do that, keep an eye out for pests, although that latex will keep a lot of things away. Keep an eye out for pests, particularly rats. They love them for some reason. And these plants will be generally pretty happy. Now, when you get to the winter months, like I'm in right now, cut back the watering quite significantly. I might water these plants maybe, you know, once a month at tops. We've got uh, winter lows in our night times down to about five or six degrees. Anything cooler than that and you might even want to start thinking about taking them indoors over the winter as they go dormant. Plenty of light. These are plants that demand, you know, in most cases full sun. And if you can do all of those things, you can get yourself a fantastic and very varied collection of plants. Because as you can see, their growth forms are fantastically different and staying just within the one genus, you can have yourself a whole collection that's the envy of other collectors. So that's the euphorbias for you. I hope you can recognize their uniqueness. I hope you feel I've celebrated these plants a little bit. If you've got any questions, hit me up in the comments. Otherwise, that's it for today. Happy growing, and I'll see you next time.